I uh, appreciate the opportunity to uh, come talk to this group again. The last time I was at uh, one of the THICA meetings was, I think, three years ago, and it was just at the time when the anaplastic thyroid guidelines uh, that the ATA published were about to be released. And so I reviewed uh, a number of points about the guidelines then and thought there were maybe, were any of you at that talk, by the way? Good, so you haven't seen this. I thought we'd go through the guidelines again, uh, but also point out some updates that have taken place since then. Uh, I want to make it very interactive. I've got probably more slides than we'll get through, so don't worry about that, but just interrupt at any time. Uh, and also would like, uh, you know, your thoughts about where the next set of guidelines ought to go, because they've just announced that they're going to start a another task force to review them. There has been some changes that have taken place just in the past three years. So getting input from uh, patients and family and members and caregivers who are involved with this uh, very difficult disease would certainly be helpful, particularly at the front end. So please feel free to share any experiences you might have. So let's go ahead and move forward. So I'll, <clears throat> my disclosures are that the National Cancer Institute and Daiichi Sankyo are sponsoring a phase two clinical trial. This was, I'll show you some limited data from the phase one trial uh, and, and the pharmaceutical companies supplying the agent for the phase two trial and the NCI's uh, funding it otherwise. And uh, because of the nature of this disease, uh, we'll be discussing some drugs that are being used off-label because there aren't any on-label drugs that are FDA approved. And so we'll be looking at, uh, initially, before we get to, to the details of guidelines, I just want to bring everybody up to date on sort of the main clinical features of anaplastic thyroid cancer. Those of you who are touched by it personally or within the family uh, have intense experience from your own uh, family, but uh, I put together some data that sort of summarizes the literature so you can get an idea of sort of the broader spectrum of how this disease behaves. And I'm going to spend some time talking about uh, goals of care because one of the important aspects of our guidelines was having a clinical bioethicist, uh, unlike many other thyroid cancers uh, where uh, most of our patients do live or even if they uh, have metastatic disease, have longer lives. With anaplastic, that's not the case. And so the issues of, of how to deal with, with a uh, critical illness uh, uh, were felt to be very important here. So here are the clinical characteristics. This was a, a summary of almost 3,000 patients, and you can see about two-thirds of pa people with ATC or anaplastic thyroid cancer are, well, so it's, it's about two-thirds uh, women. It's a disease of uh, older individuals in their mid-60s generally. Uh, the tumors are much larger in general than other thyroid cancers. The, there's often associated differentiated thyroid cancer. About 25% of patients will have a mixed histology of both differentiated and anaplastic or even poorly differentiated. About 40% of patients present with distant metastases at presentation. And those who do succumb, you can see it's often due to local disease from the growth of the tumor metastatic disease or both. Uh, and the symptoms come on fairly quickly, uh, usually related to a rapidly enlarging neck mass, hoarseness from vocal cord uh, injury, difficulty swallowing, shortness of breath, and then less common symptoms listed there. And these are the call, what's called call-specific mortality rates in follicular cell-derived thyroid cancer. And you can see the red line on the bottom, over 25 years, the percentage of patients who are going to die from papillary thyroid cancer is around 5 percent. With Herthel cell and follicular thyroid cancer, it's uh, substantially greater. But if you look at anaplastic thyroid cancer, uh, you can see it's measured in months. This is a study from uh, Brian McIver and the group up in uh, Mayo Clinic in Rochester published uh, more than 15 years ago now. So it was the experience at Mayo uh, 
in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s of, of last century. And the overall survival is broken down into stage 4A, 4B, and 4C. Anaplastic thyroid cancer is always stage 4, which is the highest stage. And 4A refers to patients where the primary tumor is limited to the thyroid. Uh, there may be lymph node involvement, but there's not been direct extension into soft tissues or muscle or other structures in the neck. And, and the average The average survival in those individuals is around six to eight months, median. Uh, with 4B, where the disease is limited to your neck, uh, but more extensive, the survival is less, and in 4C, where there's distant metastatic disease, is the most uh, aggressive of all. This is uh, a number of, of studies just showing the uh, staging distribution. So somewhere between 10, 15 percent of patients present with stage 4A and are most likely to be able to respond to aggressive therapy. The 4Bs uh, around 50 to 60 percent and 4C around 40 percent at the time of presentation. And the most common source of metastatic disease is to the lungs and the upper mediastinum and other places are less common as you can see. This pulls together a lot of different uh, papers that I reviewed and let me sort of walk you through it. Uh, in this case for instance with age there were nine papers that said that age was a predictor for how patients are going to do. Younger patients tend to do better than older patients. But, and, and you'll often read articles that will talk about age, but you'll notice there are also eight papers that said it didn't seem to make a difference. Uh, very, f there's almost no information that being male or female makes a difference. Tumor size you would think would be a very strong predictor of whether or not somebody was going to be able to have long-term survival. But when you looked at the 10 different studies, uh, a number of them tumor size didn't make a difference. However, the extent of surgery makes a big difference. In almost every series, if the tumor can be grossly resectable in the neck, those patients, as part of a multimodal therapy, have a better survival outlook than those who don't. Uh, have extensive surgery or the tumor is so extensive you can't operate. Radiotherapy is also a second part of what we call multimodal therapy. And surprisingly, and distant metastases also, in that if you have distant metastases, that's less favorable than, than if you don't at the time of diagnosis. And the thing that was sort of surprising was combination therapy didn't at least in looking at the, all of the literature, didn't seem to offer an advantage, but the more recent literature is certainly in favor. For those who want aggressive therapy, uh, that you need to do uh, surgery if possible, radiation, and uh, chemotherapy. And I won't spend time on the others because those are less, although the, uh, you can see associated uh, differentiated thyroid cancer uh, is present in about half the series. So here's what I'm going to focus on most of the time, and these are the ATA guidelines that were published now three years ago, and these are the people who uh, were participants. So we had people from University of Kentucky, uh, Toronto, Mayo and Rochester, um, Toronto, Washington, uh, NIH, uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, Pittsburgh, uh, Kentucky, Ohio State, Memorial, Memorial. So that's the composite group. And you probably recognize a number of those names. And when, when guidelines are written, have anyone ever seen clinical guidelines? Are you familiar with these at all? Okay. You're, okay. Clinical guidelines are put together by lots of different groups. They try to weigh the existing evidence and rank it 
and then come up with recommendations, and they'll come up with a whole series of questions about a particular disease, whether or not it's hypertension or high cholesterol uh, or ma doing mammograms or whatever. That's, and it's based upon evidence. And there are two things that are looked at. One is the quality of the evidence. Is the evidence in the literature high quality? And that usually requires randomized clinical trials, of which there are almost none in thyroid cancers, particularly anaplastic. There are a couple. Uh, moderate evidence or low evidence. And then they look at the strength of the recommendation. And this is professional uh, opinion of the task force. If the benefits outweigh the risks or the risks outweigh the benefits, then that recommendation is given a strong recommendation. If they're equally divided, that you really can't tell if you do this versus that, uh, it doesn't make, you don't know which is, might be better, then the evidence felt to be weak. So every recommendation gets that rating, and that's true for every guideline. And when we're talking about surgery, it's important to recognize that the surgeons try to get everything out that they can and at a minimum, uh, so they may get uh, down to just leaving microscopic disease that they don't even know they left behind until the final pathology report comes in. Or there may be no residual tumor and all microscopic disease is gone as well. So those are called R0 and R1. Those are the best to have in terms of a surgical resection. But the surgeon will often with this disease particularly say, I couldn't get it all out, I know I left some behind. And if he knows ahead of time that he can't get it all out, then he may say we shouldn't operate. And the reason for that is because that's going to delay being able to do radiotherapy and chemotherapy. Uh, and if you can't get it down to a, a more extensive surgical resection, many people will say don't operate on these. So if, you, if that's part of what you've been told, that's the reason why. So this, is, this one slide summarizes three years of work, and I'm going to take you through some of the highlights of it. But when we looked at how to evaluate and manage patients with anaplastic thyroid cancer, we started with the diagnosis. We then said, all right, what do we do for the evaluation? Then we come up with staging, and then we have to establish goals. So under diagnosis, this is a tissue diagnosis, either from cytology, from a fine needle aspirate, or from histopathology. It may be a core biopsy, or it may have been surgical resection. And these little R1 to R5 indicate that there are five different recommendations in those guidelines. You can read recommendation one. I'll show you a number of these. It'll give you a narrative, and then it'll give you uh, a ranking on it. For evaluation, we go through the clinical assessment of the patient, the laboratory studies available, and imaging. Once this is done, and with this disease as quickly as possible, we try to do this within just a couple of days. We then meet and determine, is this a patient who has disease only in the neck and is felt to be potentially resectable, or is disease limited to the neck, no distant disease, but unresectable, or does the patient have metastatic disease? So that means the patient's gone through head-to-toe imaging. Once that's done, and where there are separate figures at the, toward the end that deals with each of these in more detail, how we go through our decision-making, then we get back with the patient, let them know what the status of their tumor is, what we feel the different options are, and what the risks and benefits of each of those therapies are, we want to find out what the patient's values and preferences are once they have this information, and then the patient makes informed decision as to what they would like to do. And I'll show you a couple of, of uh, case examples of how this played out. So diagnosis, just a few words about that. I can't stress the importance of getting the appropriate diagnosis, which may require special immunostaining to exclude other less aggressive and treatable enti entities that may, just under the microscope, look like anaplastic thyroid cancer. Uh, earlier we were in a, a roundtable session. Somebody had that said they had papillary and 
uh, anaplastic cancer, and that's because they coexist. Well differentiated or papillary, papillary tall cell variant, you can have poorly differentiated, you can have follicular herthal cell, all of those can occur and actually may even help confirm that what you're looking at is anaplastic because anaplastic looks so bizarre and so uh, undifferentiated it can be hard to tell. But if you see some other elements of thyroid cancer, that tells you that it's thyroid. Three years ago, I said that molecular studies were not currently required to diagnose or manage patients with anaplastic thyroid cancer. And this is one of the updates I want to share with you just in the last three years. I put together this table and listed on the left a number of drugs that are being used now in various types of cancers, including various types of thyroid cancer. And their main targets, but not all the targets, and the reason I put these up here is all of these drugs have been shown to have some biologic activity in at least one patient who had anaplastic thyroid cancer. So most of them are case reports or just a couple of patients in a much larger series of other types of cancer, other types of thyroid cancer. But there is reason to believe that every one of these drugs has at least some biologic effect and may be probably in combination with some other drugs uh, effective in targeting the molecular abnormalities in anaplastic thyroid cancer. So I don't have, and these are, as I said, some of the, the targets, and some of them actually hit many targets. So these drugs, lenvatinib is the latest one that's being in, about to be investigated, and it hits not only this, but three or four other, other targets. Uh, all of these are, are these kinase inhibitors. Uh, this is a drug that was published in a large study, actually, which acts on the, vas on the vasculature and microtubules. This is a drug that we're studying now that synergizes with paclitaxel through a totally different mechanism but increases apoptosis and cell death. So there are a variety of different agents that are being used, and all of this data is only two or three years old. Now, in terms of trials, uh, as of last week, if you go to clinicaltrials.gov, you can find out what's available and what's recruiting. So if you type in anaplastic thyroid cancer, 30 or 40 different studies will follow up. But if they're highlighted in green and says recruiting, that study may be something that you or, or a family member or somebody with this disease may be eligible for a trial if they're interested in finding out about it. Uh, there's one up at Dana-Farber now using this mTOR inhibitor. This is the one that we're doing that is part of the Alliance, which is a national cooperative group funded by the NCI. Uh, this is one only over in France. This one is addressing uh, the ALK gene. This is one where the original data came out of Rochester and is now being run by Sloan Kettering. It's, it's radiation and paclitaxel with or mi minus one of these new agents, bisophenib. It's being done by the National Radiation Oncology Group. This is putting two BRAF inhibitors together uh, and is a multicenter trial. So these are ones that are currently available potentially for somebody who might need a trial for this disease. And I show you this. I realize you can't read it, so I'll walk you through it. But these are three different patients of the, that we've had at, at our clinic uh, within the past few months. And is anyone familiar with a company called Foundation One? You are, okay. Foundation One does molecular testing of tumors. Uh, many cancer centers also do molecular testing. They'll have a panel uh, 
of 20 or 50 or 100 genes that are related to thyroid cancer, and they'll take the patient's tumor and test it for those genetic abnormalities. And if they can find an abnormality for which there's a drug that's known to target that abnormality, then that gives you some idea of what you might try in the absence of, of a known approved effective drug. And so this is what you hear when you talk about individualized medicine, personalized medicine, what the president talked about just a few weeks ago about putting more government dollars into personalized medicine. This is happening more in oncology than any other field uh, where patients are having their own tumors tight. It's not inexpensive. Uh, we chose Foundation One for these patients because unlike other thyroid cancers where we know the genetic makeup and there are specific test panels for thyroid cancer, anaplastic is much more aggressive, has many more mutations. And so in three patients, I just show you, this patient over here had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different mutations. And each of those, I'm having trouble reading from here, but you can see for this drug, there's BRAF, and there are four different BRAF inhibitors that are available, and it tells you yes. There's a whole, there's about a 15-page document you get sent back, and it actually lists all the clinical trials around the country where there's a BRAF inhibitor, and it gives you an idea uh, if that's the only target, and that would be a great place to you. But this patient also had a BRCA1 mutation, an NF2, GI3KCA, of which two different drugs might work, and three others as well, some of which there are no treatments for. But at least in this patient, there are a number of different drugs, but we still don't know which is the most likely to be effective, if any. Because once you block one pathway, something else is going to take over. But it's, it's a starting point anyway. Yes? I have a question for you. Some of the other tests you might be rocking with and I haven't. The guns in the water are the No. For papillary thyroid cancer, which is what you told me earlier, vast majority have only one mutation. And that's why people with papillary thyroid cancer rarely die. They have one mutation. It's one of the least mutated tumors out there. And so if you accumulate more mutations, then it starts becoming fully differentiated. And when you accumulate this, and there are a lot more, I'm sure, that weren't even measured. It's all down to pleasure. Then you start having a much more serious outcome if you have just BRAF. So the vast majority of people with the BRAF mutation have only the BRAF, although some do have a second mutation called PERC. If I were going to do any one other mutation on you, I would do a TERC. Because BRAF plus TERC does carry more aggressive uh, features and outcomes than BRAF alone, and you have to be more aggressive to those patients. This is able to just run and fire. But you don't have to do one of these Extensive gene panels that cost four or five thousand dollars. The second patient had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and four or five of those I would never have thought of for anaplastic thyroid cancer. And this patient had four down here, and only one of them is targetable, but I sure wouldn't have thought of that. So we're learning something now from this newer information that may help us in the short term. Now, what I'm doing when patients come in is suggesting we get this done while your initial treatment is going on. So that we'll have that information right after you finish your radiate, your surgery, your radiation, your initial dose of chemo. Let's be prepared to, if, if we can, if we can find something that's potentially targetable that there's a drug out there for, there's, we're moving more in that direction. In the absence of a clinical trial, I would still encourage clinical trials if available, yes. Very good question, yes. very important, and yes, it could change, and it's probably worth doing again, but it takes weeks to get done. So the reason for doing it initially is you can at least start that, 
and then while you're waiting, you know, if you do something and you, you're progressing and then you need to go to another drug, you can at least try that. It might not work, but it may. And you could go ahead and do, if you can do another biopsy and, and retest, there's, you know, we're doing some studies in prostate and breast cancer that are doing exactly that. Where they're taking a biopsy of breast cancer and then going through just exactly what you're saying, and then you're doing another biopsy. But it, it gives you some information that you didn't have otherwise. So, but it's a very good point that treatment will change things uh, frequently. So this is sort of the new update that you need to be aware of, and it's really a, a rapidly evolving field. So let's look at sort of how we go through th using the guidelines. Uh, staging should not delay therapy, but it is important to get adequate staging. And this means unlike differentiated thyroid cancer where we usually don't do anything more than neck ultrasonography before surgery, with anaplastic, people ought to be staged from head to toe, including the head. So I routinely get a PET CT and a brain MRI. Uh, I had one lady who was all ready to go into a clinical trial until we did her MRI of the brain and found two lesions and immediately took her out of the trial. So if it's safe or eff and effective to resect, I'm sorry, if it's not safe or effective to, to resect, one of the things that, that can be done is to treat with what's called neoadjuvant therapy. Uh, giving either external beam radiotherapy or chemotherapy, and then the tumor may shrink, and then you can reevaluate, and they may be susceptible to surgery later. Uh, so, not done commonly, but it's something to think about if you have somebody who really wants aggressive therapy after, and, and they can't be resected right away, maybe you'll be able to a few months later. These are just two papers showing that uh, the pre-op chemo or radiation improves survival uh, who were in 12 patients in the first study who were initially unresectable. And then in another, patient, in another study, again, they had these patients. They had nine patients uh, who they were then able to go back and operate after using chemo, and four of the nine got uh, prolonged outcomes. They were still alive. Uh, 11 to 32 months after this approach. So even if the surgeon says, and we hear this, you know, oh, it's, un it's inoperable, go home. Uh, one patient told me recently he was told to go home and get a bottle of bourbon. Uh, there are things that can be done. Why do I keep hitting something? So again, more data just showing the survival based upon the stage. With 4A, you can see six-month survival. But even with 4A disease, even if you think you've got it all, this is why we say, even though the surgeon says, I got it all, and the pathologist says it's all, probably have or may have micrometastatic disease. And so we really feel, even if it's confined to the thyroid, go ahead and give a course of radiation and probably chemotherapy as well. Uh, 
So what about treatment goals? This is the part where we had our, our bioethicist uh, who talked to us about decision-making capacity and concerns being concerned about impaired capacity uh, in order to assess a bar barriers in making informed decisions. And these were some interesting questions that uh, are in the guidelines if you're interested in it and things to, to talk to patients about and that you should share with your doctors uh, in terms of making this very, very difficult decision with very little time to make that decision. But this is after you've got all the information about the disease itself, where you fit into that pattern that I've shown you, and what the likelihood of responding if you do undergo uh, aggressive therapy, because that's not uh, without a lot of side effects. So the, the recommendation was that uh, there should be a multidisciplinary team, and then that team should meet with the patient uh, to disclose all of the potential risks and benefits of the different treatment options, including how these options will impact one's life. And these discussions should include palliative care and then the patient preferences should guide, guide clinical management. And patients with this disease are encouraged to have an advanced directive, uh, typically called a do not resuscitate. They're now moving towards something called allow natural death to really appreciate this because this is a difficult time in everybody's life to try to deal with these very strong, uh, these very serious problems. So in terms of uh, local regional disease, you want to find out if, if it's resectable, and we talked about imaging for that, and if it's felt that you can get what's referred to as a negative or R1 resection, then surgical resection should certainly be considered. And even if patients have systemic disease, that's stage 4C, at least consider resection of the primary tumor for palliation to avoid current or eventual airway or esophageal obstruction. Uh, there are many people who will say, well, it's metastatic, go home, don't bother with surgery. Again, you've got to see what each individual patient is presenting with, what the options are, what the risks are of local disease. As I showed you earlier, many people uh, succumb to the local complications of this disease and not the systemic ones. And if, if, you, if they do have disease that extends outside of the thyroid, uh, then the surgeon is prepared to do, to try to get a grossly negative margin. And this shows why people are recommending this. The influence of the extent of surgical resection. These are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different studies, and these are the outcomes. So I talked to you about these R0, R1, R2 resections. The three-year survival, if you could get a, a R0 resection, was 50% versus only 4% if you couldn't get that resection. And you can see two-year survival, 75 versus 6%. One-year survival, 92 versus 35 versus 4, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, surgery really has an effect if, if it, is a, if it uh, can be done. So here's where we have a, a bit of a puzzle. And this is if you happen to find just a little incidental anaplastic. The patient's operated on for something totally unrelated. Uh, they have papillary cancer and they find a three millimeter focus of anaplastic cancer. Do you treat that as though it's the whole thing was anaplastic and give them extensive radiation chemotherapy? And here from the panel, a majority of the panel members favored cautious observation with frequent imaging for at least the first year, a minority would recommend adjuvant therapy even with that tiny focus, meaning there just isn't any data to tell us what's better or worse. The issue of airway is a very important one with anaplastic thyroid cancer because this tumor grows rapidly. It uh, invades the esophagus and, and the 
trachea. And so if the patient is going to have a tracheostomy, it's felt to be done uh, in an operating room setting uh, and uh, unless they present to the emergency room uh, and, and are having difficulty breathing. But doing a tracheostomy in somebody who has a massive tumor can be difficult in and of itself. And so these, again, are very challenging issues uh, that the patient, the family, and, and the surgeon have to make, often on the spur of the moment with not a whole lot of time. Uh, I won't say any more about that now. So if you've determined that the patient has a surgically resectable lesion, then those who have good performance status, no evidence of metastatic disease, and who wish an aggressive approach should be offered definitive radiation. And this may be, may or may not be without concurrent chemotherapy. When you add chemotherapy to radiation, that increases the toxicity. So some physicians will recommend just the highest dose of radiation. Some will say, well, we'll maybe give slightly less radiation and we'll give a small dose of chemotherapy because it's thought that chemotherapy can, quote, sensitize the tumor to radiation. So many patients will get a, a smaller than full treatment dose of, of, of chemo during the radiation and then after the radiation has ended, they'll get a higher dose of chemo. But this is after, again, all of those goals of treatment have been evaluated with the patient, discussed, and you find out what the patient wants to do. And this shows the value of radiotherapy after uh, complete resection. Dr. Kabibu published the SEER data is a, is a national data bank uh, from the United States. And it showed that survival was, was, in, was affected uh, using a, what's called a multivariate analysis. The things that fell out that were statistically significant were age, that is, younger patients had better outcomes than older patients, and the extent of resection in combination with external beam radiotherapy. So in that large study, uh, which was a cross-section of our country, uh, age and extent of, of uh, aggressive therapy were the ones that impacted uh, survival. And a smaller study, but was population-based in Canada, showed that survival was significantly impacted if you could do more extensive surgery and high-dose radiation therapy. So assuming the patient was able to have surgery, then what do you do after that? Well, you should be thinking immediately of radiation, and that can be started within two to three weeks after the surgery. And if you're going to use systemic chemotherapy, that may be able to be given as early as one week after surgery, but it depends on how quickly the, you know, if there were any complications from the surgery, if the patient is healing well. These are all daily discussions that take place amongst the radiation oncologist, the medical oncologist, and the surgeon, and the patient. So those who have had less extensive uh, resection because of the extent of disease, but who want to be aggressive, and they, they have good performance status, that means they're not crippled from other health measures, uh, they're fairly uh, healthy otherwise, and they say they want to go through an aggressive approach, if they have unresectable disease, then definitive high-dose radiation, possibly with chemotherapy, is what's recommended. And you can see with each of these, that was felt to be a strong recommendation and moderate evidence that that would be beneficial to the patient. And if you want details, because I'm throwing a huge amount of information at you, these guidelines are available on the ATA website. Any of you can go on and pull them on and, and get a copy of the entire document. So what about the dose of radiation? If you have disease that is not resectable in the neck, uh, does the dose of radiotherapy matter? And it does. A, a minimum of 30 gray uh, 
preferably above 40 or 45, improve survival, 11 versus three months, five versus one, uh, 54% uh, alive at one year versus 17. So at least significant changes, in this case, significant improvement out to one year. And we're actually using, for the IMRT now, uh, up to 6,000 or more grays. So they can get a higher dose to the neck with a more modern radiation technique. And here is for many of the patients, unfortunately, who come in, they have a lot of symptoms, poor performance status. Uh, you don't think they can withstand that aggressive therapy or they don't want that therapy then should certainly offer palliative radiotherapy. By that, I mean a lower dose. It doesn't cause as many side effects and will hopefully uh, at least reduce the likelihood of there being continued growth of this tumor in the neck. And getting back to the type of, of radiotherapy, if they're going to receive it, if possible, you want this dose called intensity modulated radiation therapy, or IMRT. It's been given in more and more centers now, and it allows the radiologist or the radiation therapist to give a much higher dose to the tumor uh, and reduce the dose to the esophagus, the trachea, the spinal column. Uh, but requires special equipment and knowledge to be able to, to give that kind of, of radiation. Okay, what about systemic therapy? Because this tumor, even if you think you've got it cured with surgery and maybe radiation, it's often spread microscopically. You just haven't seen it yet. So the concept of multimodal therapy giving systemic therapy to try to kill any unrecognized cancer cells is felt to add uh, likelihood of, of getting a long-term response. And so this is where right now we're using cytotoxic chemotherapy. The drug of choice is one of the taxanes, either paclitaxel or docetaxel or doxorubicin or one of the platinum drugs, either as a single agent or in combination as agents and possibly in combination with radiation therapy. Again, patients should be in good, good health otherwise, preferably with non-metastatic disease who desire aggressive therapy, but we are getting more aggressive even with those who have metastatic disease. And I showed you earlier a slide of a whole host of new drugs where we know the specific targets, at least in some cases, that hopefully in the next few years we'll see more studies using those drugs in clinical trials to try to find which ones offer the most promise. This is a study from Mayo Clinic in Rochester. Uh, this was just the first 10 patients, but they've now extended this to over 40 patients with similar results. I showed you earlier this part of the slide, the Mayo historical data. Once they started treating with aggressive multimodal therapy, including after surgery, this intensity modulated radiation plus adjuvant chemotherapy. This is the five year survival rate. I mean, it was really quite impressive, uh, but it was only 10 patients, and it did not include any patients with 4C disease. If they had metastatic disease, they didn't offer it. They're now offering it to people with metastatic disease and they've increased the, the size of the population substantially, getting similar data. The data is being analyzed now. There's one other study that came out about the same time from France, uh, and they had patients with 4A, 4B, and 4C disease. They also used a very aggressive multimodal therapy, not a, and more than half of these did not have complete research, surgical resection. And then they gave radiation then they gave combination chemo, and then you can see they actually had some patients, almost a third of them, who the tumor disappeared completely, a CR. 
they had another 18% who had a partial response, and then about half uh, didn't just progress straight through it. And you can see the median survival was out to two and a half years. That means half the people were still alive then. Doesn't mean that's as, as long as you're going to live. Half the people were living that, that long. When you basically tell people that if they are older, and by older this would be high 60s, 70s, 80s. If, if somebody's in their mid 60s or below, that's one factor that may allow them to respond. I had a uh, tumor that was diagnosed in Atlanta 10 years ago, but it had other components. It had capillary and purple cell. showing that the same pathologist can give the same slide 
successive days have an all that's created to it. Wow. Uh, so, I hope that was the answer. So molecular testing is important and special staying. Uh, all, all of those can help pathologists with the diagnosis because anaphylaxis look bizarre. I mean, they look like, what the heck is this? It's so undifferentiated that it's hard to tell from the sarcoma or from squamous cell carcinoma, the head and neck, or, you know, there's just lots of other very poorly differentiated cancers. So they use everything they can to try to sort it out. And even then, they don't always There is immunostaining now for BRAF. Uh, and anaplastic has different types yet. There are different immunostains for anaplastic as well. And it's helpful in your case to know what percentage of the tumor was each of these. We don't see much published on that, but I've had a few patients where I've asked the pathologist to go back and say, you know, is it, it turned out it's 40% poorly differentiated and 30% papillary. 15% anaplastic. There's not enough in the literature to say if we had that information on every tumor in which there were multiple tumor types in there, we would be able to use that also in helping to get prognosis. You would like to think that if it's only 10% anaplastic, that it would be better than if it was 80% anaplastic. My guess would be, but I don't know that. We don't have data to say that. So one of the things in the future maybe we'll get more precise in trying to find what, what percent, because that may be clinically relevant. Is, it, is, it, is that test possible now? Well, that's just doing the percentage-wise is just getting a pathologist to look and, and look, spend a lot of time just looking at the whole field and okay. making the rough estimate. But he could do it. It could be done, yeah. We've got just a couple of minutes, and then uh, I'm not sure if we're going to get through all of it, but please keep asking questions. We don't have to finish all the slides. Uh, oh, if somebody is going through intensive radiation, it's usually a good idea to go ahead and put a feeding tube in, a gas oxygen tube, because if you're really getting aggressive and there's a lot of inflammation, soreness, you can't swallow, and, and the nutrition goes down, you're not recovering well, then you've got to do it when you're in that kind of state. So our radiation therapist often advises patients to go ahead and have one put in, get the radiation out of the way, and then they can remove it. I don't know what your old doctors have recommended, but that's at least one, one approach. Uh, and and because if you're going with aggressive therapy, you may need uh, granulocytology, GM, what's called GMCSF, to support and help generate white blood cells because this chemo is really going to knock the heck out of your immune system. Advanced disease. Uh, this just says that occasionally aggressive therapy, even in advanced metastatic disease, may improve survival. So it's reasonable to consider if somebody really wants to be aggressive. But they've got to know that the chances are small, the mortality, morbidity is high, do they want to put themselves through that? Uh, this just outlines the first-line therapies and the second-line therapies. Uh, this was a patient who, I'm not going to have time to get through all of these, but the bottom line was you were asking about staining. This patient had an immunohistochemistry that was positive for the EGF receptor. And I put a drug on that early, this was a patient of mine, and the patient was treated and actually went for several years with a single agent EGF receptor antagonist. She eventually metastasized. We tried to get her on a trial, but she waited too late before she came back to us. But she did well for several years, and with the man of one, we can't prove it now, but it was at least taking you know, some biology and applying a, a new therapy based on that. And I'll skip that. Uh, as you can see, there's a tumor. Ultimately, she unfortunately did die. This patient, 
Oh, this, actually, I do want to show you, because this is a patient who had a reasonable size tumor. Uh, you can see it invaded the neck, had some follicular carcinoma, then she came to see us. Uh, she had some lung nodules. Uh, we offered her either combination cytotoxic therapy or going on a clinical trial. Uh, the first trial we offered, she didn't qualify for, but she enrolled in this other trial, which is the phase two trial we're conducting now. And we're looking for patients, if anybody knows anybody. It's a combination of paclitaxel and randomized whether or not they get the second drug. It's for somebody who's already had radiation, but needs something after radiation. And the trial is open at uh, many sites throughout the United States. I'd be happy to talk to anybody about it. The reason it went on to a phase two trial was this was uh, one the patient who responded in a small trial. There's a one tumor, part of the tumor, that shrunk in size, and this monitored the tumor reduction that reduced by about 50% out to about six months, and then she escaped after that. But it showed this combination of that biologic activity, and at least has allowed us to take it into a trial to test it further. Uh, so again, patients who have advanced disease should be encouraged, if they want an aggressive approach, should be encouraged to participate in clinical trials. But, and this is a big but, it may not be most appropriate for all patients. And certainly consideration of best supporting care in hospice should also be prominently discussed I always test for the presence of brain metastases, even if they're asymptomatic. And in terms of palliative care, this, this was a very, uh, to me, unfortunate patient who presented 55 years old. Age is supposed to be favorable. She came in with a mass, and she had lung nodules before she came to us. They were positive on PET. She had her thyroidectomy. Uh, it was anaplastic. And you can see here her multiple nodules in her lungs. We gave her that information, told her aggressive therapy. She, she had her daughter, by the way, her 10 year old daughter with her. We had this trial open at the time. We offered her off label chemotherapy, local radiation, or supportive care. She considered all of these things. So treatment should include palliative care at every st appropriate stage of patient management, and it should be offered to help with pain and symptom control, to help with psychosocial and spiritual issues. Uh, and palliative care services are appropriate for any anaplastic patient receiving treatment with limited to long life. Uh, hospice should be brought in for patients who decline therapy. And for long term, and that's really so. The final slide, and then we'll wrap up, is sort of a detail of that first overview slide I showed you. So, management options this was the first one I showed you, but then you can go in and look at this slide and see all right, if the patient has tumor resectable, here's the sequence of events from surgery, radiation. If they have no evidence of disease, here's the follow up. If they have local recurrence, here's the follow up. If they have systemic disease, there's the follow up. Each of these tells what recommendation you can quickly refer to in the guidelines to read more about it, and the narrative with the literature cited for each one of those recommendations. There's a separate table for unresectable 4B disease, and there's a final table for 4C disease. Any questions? Okay. I think we're right on time with two minutes left. So I know I hit you with an enormous amount, uh, but hopefully you can take a few nuggets home with whether or not you and your family members and people you know. Certainly, when this diagnosis comes up, reach out to one of the medical centers 
um, Richard about that, is also aware. It would be perhaps more likely to come from a radio, from a radio iodine refractory window, but that probably has been genetic makeup. It might be the code, but it's still not common. And it's certainly not the first, second, third, or fourth thing I've ever talked to any of my patients about this. I don't even Detail of the situation, but I would say probably not. Anything else? Thank you so Thank much you for your time. time.